Welcome to Mastara, where we are taking the latest D&D offering and converting it from its intended settings to the far better and much more fun Mastara. This time it's the anthology Journeys to the Radiant Citadel, where the focus is on settings based on non-European cultures. Fortunately for us, Mastara is filled with countries that are allegories for real-world cultures across the globe, because that's one of the reasons why we rock. So where are we going? Is my opinion of anthologies going to change? Time to put on your Surinamese national hockey team jersey. I'm Mr. Welch and go lesser Kiskadees! Seriously, those birds rock. They aren't all pretentious like greater Kiskadees. So that's why Suriname picked it as their national animal. Sure, they aren't known for their hockey, granted, but you gotta take your D&D players where you can get them, even if the snacks every week are just tapas and stroopwafel. But you can't complain because they show up and play like clockwork. But on with the conversion. Radiant Citadel is 224 pages. The exact page count is the far superior and better written Mastara Player's Guide, but you already knew that. The premise is there's a floating city in the ethereal plane where all these different cultures arrived because life was terrible where they came from and they decided to settle down. Everyone lives in harmony and there's no strife, crime, poverty, or apparent grasp of economics. It's meant to be a utopia, but the premise falls apart quickly if you even think about it halfway. They pay their taxes through high tariffs and don't have smugglers? Seriously? You tax the snot out of people trying to bring in products, and nobody tries to sneak past the guards to sell their goods at a much lower rate, guaranteeing they will make far more money than the merchants that have to raise their prices to counterbalance the taxes. Despite the book mentioning several of these cultures fleeing from very bad people, they don't seem to have an armed guard. People have compared Radiant Citadel to Planescape, but Sigil? This place ain't. There's not even ten pages about the Radiant Citadel, which is far too short to give more than just a cursory explanation. It's meant to be a utopia where everybody heals quickly and death is temporary because you don't need to spend money for resurrection components. Utopias are boring. There's your first problem. This is meant to be a hub world, but it reinforces 5th edition's reputation for being pillow-fisted with the players. No threat, no thrill. Remember that when you're building adventures. Some technical points before we dig into the conversion. The writer's names are not attached to what they wrote anywhere that I could find in the book. I'm looking at these adventures blind because I'm not going to go online to figure out who wrote what. That should have been in the book. They could have done that on the table of contents, on the adventures themselves, or even having an author's page where you get a snippet of each one's experience in previous works. But we get none of that. I don't know why there's no byline, but it is noticeable. If I tried to pull that stunt in my magazine, I would get skinned. For all I know, every adventure here was written by Aaron A. Aronson from Sanford Gloucestershire using 13 different pen names. I know art is objective, but the alternate cover art is the ugliest D&D cover art I have ever seen and I've got all the second edition Mistara stuff. It looks like something you would find at a Scholastic Book Fair written for a fourth grader. The interior art is pretty stock D&D, but this is where I wish they would have veered from formula. You're trying to showcase all these different cultures, then give me images of the adventures in the traditional style of those cultures. Hire artists from those nations. A picture is worth a thousand words, and if you're showcasing writers of different cultures, pair them up with matching artists. Increase my immersion in your setting. This is a module conversion, so it is for DMs. There's nothing but spoilers ahead. The first adventure is Salted Legacy, and it's less of an adventure and more of a diversion. It's lighthearted, with the savage and murderous kobolds drawn up like cartoon characters. You're trying to solve a disagreement between rival market stall vendors. There's supposed to be gnomes and kobolds, and there is a Chinese vibe hinted at, but this is pretty generic. If you want to put it anywhere, Minerthrad's your best choice. There's a festival going on. There's actually a festival going on in the first several adventures, which is a rather odd editing choice to have at least a quarter of the adventures having similar backgrounds. The gnomes and kobolds become any races common to Mistara. You can turn the invisible fey creatures into, well, just about anything invisible, because their role in the adventure is pretty tiny. Just watch out for she players, because they can see the invisible fey naturally. There's a bunch of mini games, but no combat outside of a canned fight against some uppity giant crawdads. This is the kind of side quest you go through with the players that didn't volunteer to drive to HEB to get more Dr. B, and you have an hour to kill until the guy that's actually going to get you sodas comes back. The second level finds you in Written in Blood, which is based on the southern U.S., with the art depicting people apparently from New Orleans or similar. So we need to find a like area in Mastara, with a dark-skinned population and a Gulf Coast geography. So we got to head west, past Sin and closer to the Savage Baronies. But not too close because of the Red Curse and all. We haven't given Yavdalim much love in our past conversions, which does match the criteria. Specifically, the city of Ngomo, which is far from the capital, so the players don't have to run for the diviners. The problem here is the farmers are going crazy and attacking people. You can change one of the NPCs at the start to be a low-level diviner to keep with the Yavs theme, 
Of course, she's going to divine that the player characters are the ones needing to stop all this. Remember to change a few NPCs to elves and give a few others elven features to reflect Yabdalum's interbreeding. There aren't any half-elves, because half-elves are a few hundred miles away, but elven features run strong even generations later here. The bad guys are crawling claws, and the big boss is a bunch of crawling claws merged into a bigger crawling claw. You're close enough to the Red Coast that maybe this thing was one of the numerous abominations found in that cursed region and just stowed away on a ship. Players stab it a lot, go up to level 3, and we turn the page. The Fiend of Hollow Mine is equal parts dungeon crawl and tavern crawl, as it's supposed to be Mexico during Day of the Dead. I know a few other countries celebrate it, but this is mostly based in Mexico. There are many Spanish names, and fortunately, there are a lot of Spanish-speaking allegories in Mastara. My Spanish is pretty limited, but as a Texan, I know enough for emergencies. So if the situation ever arises, I at least know how to say, Mi culpa? Contrataste la prostituta con un problema cardiaco. So time to find the place closest to Mexico, the desert parts of Mexico. Bel Cadiz is right out, because that's not desert, that's mountains. So we're headed to the Savage Coast. Grab some Cinebril, because we're headed to Torreon. It's got a history of mercenaries, it's dirt poor, it's mostly desert, and they've got a reason to celebrate the dead. If you want to hand wave it, say the Red Curse is not in this particular part of Torreon, which would be the fortress city of Casanegra by the Terra Vermitha Desert. Say the players haven't been there for two weeks and the curse hasn't taken effect, or just come up with a legacy and an affliction for all of them and give them some Cinebril. Casanegra is being affected by a curse. Well, not one of the usual curses. A fourth and brand new curse, because curses love the Savage Coast. For starters, everybody you will meet is a good guy. That's a reoccurring theme. There's very few evil humans in these adventures. Even the humanoids are all good. Of course, this is Mastara, so that last part is a lie, and we'll just change that as we go. The party is hired to find the source of the curse, which is demonic in nature, but rather than just some bird demon, we've got someone far better. At Xantiotl, everybody's favorite patron of corruption. Plus, the immortal of corruption sounds a lot better as a villain than the demon lord of birds. There's an evil tiefling, like there's any other kind, but he gets changed to a regular human and you'll never notice the difference. There's nothing else to convert in the module as all the rest of the monsters are standard baddies found everywhere, and the boss monster is exclusive to this adventure, so it's time for the next level. Wages of Vice is another festival and a murder mystery. This one is pretty short. As the general theme is wealth and greed, let's go off the map and head to the proposed nation from Skothar, Mototor. The allegory for Mali, when it was rich beyond measure. Hammer that point home. The guards are wearing mithril plate mail. Coins are worthless because the mines produce so much wealth. The local currencies are trade bars and paper money backed by jewels. Everyone is sporting excessive amounts of jewelry. It's almost impossible to be poor here. The streets are literally paved with gold. And the party arrives as part of a trade caravan. Or maybe Serain brings them here for the festival. Remember, the nation's wealth is impossible to fathom, but theft gets you executed. The mines provide. Be happy with what you've got. This particular festival is a wine festival. And wouldn't you know it, the party finds a corpse and gets blamed for it. It's not for long, it's pretty easy to clear their names. The body was poisoned with a rare and expensive poison. There's no raising the victim from the dead, even in a nation as wealthy as Mototor. Without giving up too much of the plot, the killers are using spirits as an act of revenge. Use the rules for the various spirits from the spirit world, and it's super easy to convert this one. This isn't a bad little adventure for its length. It's short, concise, and it doesn't waste space on exposition. Sins of Our Elders is obviously based in Korea, and it's also got a lot of spirits. Mistara doesn't have a Korean allegory on the surface, but it does above the surface. We're going to Miyashima, to a place only mentioned in passing. We'll put Yao Nido in the smaller confederation of nations facing off against the empire of Miyashima. It's a perfect fit. All we have to do is turn everyone in this module into Warakasta, and done. Now let's take a look at the adventure. I suggest having all the commoners become domestic Rakasta and replace the Dragonborn with Greater Rakasta. So you've got Korean tigers leading the people. The rest of the module features spirits and regular monsters like gargoyles. Just remember, everybody's a Rakasta. Gold for Fools and Princes is our next adventure, and it fits best in Yalara. If you want to stick it with the darker skin population like in the original adventure, go with Nithia. You'll have to kick the Empress out because this is an emirate, not an empire. Sticking with Nithia, the Vizier has set up a new vouchery to handle the area's mineral rights. The princes are now rival Yalari nobles who want that vouchery and will play dirty to get it. At least the bad guy will. The evil cleric is now a bitter follower of Al-Kalim who is more than willing to help the villain for increased status and wealth. Instead of becoming emperor, the winner of this conflict succeeds Anaya and gets to be in charge of mining all the gold. The Orm Vorox is essential to the plot because of its gold diet, so keep them around. 
Trail of Destruction has an Aztec vibe to it, but it's not a good fit for Tigerlands because those guys don't exactly play well with others. If you want everybody to be a native of Kuan Mitzli, be my guest, but otherwise we're going to need to approximate. And there's only one place where we're going to even get close to Mesoamerica. We're going to the Hollow World to hang out with the Oltex. You're going to have to make some changes. Remember, teleportation magic doesn't work. You'll need a primary stat of 17 just to cast spells there, and it's all Bronze Age. Very few nations in that area know how to work iron, and the Oltex aren't one of them. If you have to, you can make the characters part of the Lighthouse Expedition to get around the pesky spell of preservation. All demi-humans are now humans. The Hollow World does not mix its races, except the Merry Pirates. There's a tiefling entertainer that screams DMPC that wants to tag along, but you can ignore him. The monsters in this adventure are normal Mastara monsters with a unique big bad, so there's not much to change here. The Mists of Manavarsha deal with a tragedy on the last day of, wait for it, wait for it, another festival. This is obviously based in India, and we just so happen to have Sind waiting there to get used. This adventure requires an area near a wetland marsh or swamp, and Sind just happens to have several places right next to Nimkim Yelanka, a massive swamp hundreds of miles across. So let's put this adventure right in the town of Nakashwar. You're going to run across some creatures called the Riverine, which are nature spirits, and river spirits in particular, so just attach the spirit tag for spell purposes and there you go. Instead of a forest, you head deep into the Nimkin Yalaka, where the adventure largely plays out as written. And unlike other adventures so far, at least this one pays well. These adventures are pretty sparse on goodies, especially magic items. Between Tangled Roots is going to thrill my family because this is based on Filipino lore. Bet you didn't know I came from a traditional Welsh Filipino family. Aunt Vicky married into the clan, and now we have a traditional Filipino Thanksgiving because her spring rolls blow away any turkey you might ever cook. The problem is we don't have a nation based specifically on the Philippines, but we've got the perfect place to put one. Time to head to the Thanagoath Archipelago. The party is heading down on a merchant ship to one of the thousand islands here, and one of them happens to be the Yalongan. These are a collection of islands connected by sky bridges, essentially floating roads. Dragons built them in the book, but to make them a star, just make them Nithian. Because what ancient mysterious thing isn't Nithian? When the Nithians went away, so did knowledge of who built the bridges, so they just assumed that the dragons did it. Then you're off to fight the Bakanoa, the sea dragons, or if you want to keep it Mastaran, just use the regular sea dragon stat. Then the party gets the treasure and finds one of my most hated D&D tropes, finding the monster killing specific weapon in the treasure hoard of the monster it would kill. TSR did that, Bioware did that, and now Watsi is doing that. Stop it! Shadow of the Sun has a Persian vibe, which normally puts it in Hul. Hul, like the Tiger Clan, doesn't play well with others, and their religious dictatorship doesn't mesh well with this adventure. So we have to go near Hul, where we encounter another festival, which is what, six adventures out of ten so far? I don't know if it was an editorial decision, or if about half the writers decided they want to set their adventure in a festival. It just seems like a weird commonality for an anthology. Or it could have been a subtle cry for a vacation. But let's find a place for the brilliant night festival. We need a location with a desert near Hul. How about Budovic? It's a free village caught between Hul and the city-state of Zvornik. Nothing official about it, so it fits in perfectly. The festival is going great until the purple worms show up and make a mess of things. Then an actual angel appears, which will be a problem. Because angels aren't allowed in Mastara without permission. And this guy certainly does not have permission. Since he summons even more angels, that's definitely not going to get past the Council of Intrusion. So we gotta find an equivalent fast. As this guy's only job is to give directions and get the actual plot started, a dragon could work. But grabbing from the Savage Coast Monsters Companion, you've got the only greater Shidu in Mastara making his appearance. He's more than capable of delivering his lines and then just flying away. The plot has two religious groups at each other's throats, but these are more elemental than divine types. There is a chance that the party will get lawful neutral manticores as mounts, and if you find that a bit silly, there's a whole host of actual flying mounts in Mastara available. Moving on to Night Sea Sucker, we have to find a new home for the relocated people who have escaped slavery trying to establish a new nation. Mastara has no shortage of slavers, but few can ravage an entire nation. But wait, Skothar has the Slaver's Coast, based on the Barbary Pirates. So these are descendants of slaves from multiple nations of eastern Skothar, and they have formed their own island nation off of one of the numerous islands of South Skothar. In this adventure, you must find the cause of a bunch of undead plaguing the region. There's a race of seagoing creatures that live among the humans. You can easily make them sea elves for a Mastaran creature. The big bad is an Aboleth, which is a race that gets stepped on in Mastara by the Knights of Ebony for good measure. So we need a replacement. For a real challenge, replace it with a Night Dragon. 
That'll throw your players for a loop. Now we headed to Buried Dynasty from Astara's first and only mention in this book. Buried Dynasty is China. Every adventure in this book gives you recommendations on where to put it in various settings. The Radiant Citadel always gives you a suggestion, and you always get a recommendation for Forgotten Realms, because of course you have to include Faerun and everything. But in Mastara, you get told to place it west of Darakin, so just past India and that weird Knoll Elf underground country, then past Central Africa and the nation of elf-blooded diviners just past that, then skip past the collection of well-defined city-states where you have to head into the Savage Baronies. Then you just head past Spain, Portugal, Texas, Second Spain, Argentina, Tres España, Brazil, and finally Spain number four. Then make your way through the Saxons, the Gauls, the French dogs, the English cats, the shape-changing giant spiders, the Australian aboriginal lizardmen, flying raccoon mitten with a grudge, and then Samaria. And we've run out of room. Or we could just set this in Ochalia where they've already got a China allegory. You know there's a meticulous Scottish cartographer who maps all this stuff. He even puts it up for free. Just saying, if you ever want to put something in Mastara again and you're looking for a spot, I know a guy. So, since Ochilia is a province of Thyatis and not its own empire, we've got to rewrite some stuff. Now it's the provincial governor. Ochilia is left to rule itself, but if the governor dies, Thin Call gets to appoint a new one. Well, the current governor is getting old and needs a stronger potion of longevity. His secretary is trying to hold his government together, but she's also trying to set herself up as a replacement. Ochilia might have strict rules about women's roles in government, but Thincall doesn't care. She's still loyal to the current governor, but she's also updating her resume just in case. Despite this adventure focusing on Chinese lore and mythology, all the monsters are straight out of the Dungeon Master's Guide. That's just a bit disappointing. Lastly, we get to the Orchids of the Invisible Mountains. This one is in Central America, so we're headed back to the Savage Coast. For this, we are headed to Estado de Guadalante. Well, more off to the side so we can get to the forest to match the terrain. Here reality is coming apart as the Good Kingdom and the Demiplane of Nightmares are struggling to break through. We're using the Demiplane of Nightmares instead of the Far Realms because that region is just as horrific and it's already well established with Mastara. All the new monsters introduced get the Nightmare tag for creature type. Again, assign legacies and afflictions as necessary and remember, everybody's red. You've got to replace the Thrykreen as we're not cribbing monsters from Athos and since we're in the Savage Coast, let's replace them with something from there. How about a turtle riding a Nictu, which is a turtle centaur-like creature? You've got more abolists there, but you can replace those with wormlings and their entourage for a really unique encounter. The more Thrykreen you encounter later, just change them into the Mithuan folk to keep with the Savage Coast Monsters theme. After that, everything you're going to face is all nightmare creatures. That's all the adventures. Like all anthologies, they vary wildly in quality. If I had to pick my top three, I'd start with Wages of Vice. It's very hard to do a D&D &D mystery, but this one got it right. It's short and well written. It avoids adding too many red herrings that serve no other purpose other than to mislead the party down too many dead ends, just for the sake of padding. Then you got Trail of Destruction. While it has monsters, it has a strong man versus nature vibe that you don't get from many adventures. It was refreshing to see somebody try this again, though I recommend losing the guy that decides he's going to join your party no matter what. Nobody likes escort missions, especially if they're escorting a bard. The Fiend of Hollow Mine is pretty linear, but it does have an interesting twist at the end. The Day of the Dead tie-in is a bit cliché. Every holiday in Mexico seems to be Dia de Muertos. Why not try Dia de Reos to be different from every other representation of Mexican holidays in pop culture? For adventures I had a problem with? Let's start with the opening adventure, Salted Legacy. This reads like Dungeon Magazine filler. The plot is minimal, there's almost no real chance of failure, and success is almost given to the players. That's boring for me. Barry Dynasty has a sudden but inevitable betrayal that most experienced players will see coming from a mile away. The Tagalong Spy Chick doesn't expect to be betrayed, despite the fact it's her job to figure out what people's motives are. To compound the issue, the advisor at the beginning does make it clear that success is not guaranteed and what you're looking for might not even exist. So why betray the party? Last on the list of adventures that needed to be better was Between Tangled Roots. It's an adventure based on the Philippines that only gives us one new monster? Come on, man! This is the place that comes up with monsters faster than Games Workshop creates overpriced rule books. Where's the Aswang? The Mankokulam? The Mananangal? You gotta represent! If you want to expand on the setting, just write down the names of all the monsters you can think of, sort them out alphabetically, cut it off at a good round number, say 350, 
get the art, make some rules, give the backgrounds for all the monsters, and when you're finally done with that list of 350, then you can move on to the monsters that start with the letter B. I do wish this book had more room for expanded adventures. They don't even need to drop any. This is a short book. It's only 224 pages. It's 32 pages shorter than Witchlight. If I'm playing in a setting, I want it to be immersive, not a three-page gazetteer and an eight-page adventure. Not like the price changes. You're still looking at 50 bucks for 30 additional pages. There's not enough background on most of these regions to tell me anything outside of what I can infer. The Philippines adventure is 10 pages. The Philippines gazetteer is two. If I need a writer to explain a new setting to me, at least give him enough pages to make it interesting. Eight pages minimum to write about the new setting. I don't care if they will have to expand on it in future products. In that case, give me the expanded background first so I can get interested in the adventure. Expanding the book could have given us a few more pages for each setting. Maybe drop two or three adventures to make more room for the rest. Two pages isn't a taste of what's to come. It's not even a sniff. This is catching the tail end of a commercial as you flip channels. There's been a lot made about the advertising campaign of pushing the writer's races on us instead of telling us, I don't know, what they've done in the past. I have no idea who wrote these adventures, much less their skin color. As far as I know, they were all done by the same ginger nut in West Country using multiple nom de plumes. If I'm hyping artists, I'm talking about their achievements and their prior works. I wasn't going to say anything about this until I got my hands on the book, but now I got my hands on the book. When I write something, I want to be known for the quality of my work, not some physical attribute. These are the days of the internet. You can call yourself any name and no one will be the wiser. I find that advertising your authors using their skin color rather than their bibliography is off-putting and a marketing stunt. I know they're trying to stir up controversy. Controversy sells. Come buy the book the other side doesn't like. Great. What happens if they give the book to a total amateur who screws up their assignment like what happened with Candlekeep? People appreciate quality. That's all they appreciate. There are a lot of really pretty games out there that are complete garbage that nobody reads. There's a lot of authors from the same background competing for shelf space. Pick the best one only because of the quality of the work, not because of some physical characteristics. The book is average in my taste, but that's been my opinion of almost all the anthologies so far. Salt Marsh and Yawning Portal get a pass because those are more of a best of than an actual anthology. Some of my points are purely objective, like using traditional art from those cultures instead of stock D&D art. For the love of God, put the writer's names next to the titles. The gazetteers are too short to be of much use for long-term purposes. The book needs to be larger. The Citadel section is not even 10 pages long. I would have put the gazetteers in the first chapter to separate them from the adventures. But those are technical suggestions. Just remember, for the most fun, play it in Mastara. Now I'm going to try to get up the video on games, because I'm not letting the copper thieves get me behind schedule. Until then, remember if you have any geography questions about Mastara, Thorfinn Tate is your man.